thank you everyone for coming today to the second annual Women's History Month speaker series, um, Community Connection Hour presented by the Family Learning Center coordinators. Um, we're excited to have you all here today um, for our special topic and our, our last event of the series, which is Women Providing Healing, Promoting Hope via Civic Engagement to Foster a Thriving Community for Generations. Um, so we can probably go to the next slide. So today we have our first panelist, Blanca Alvarado. Um, Blanca Alvarado is a community activist and first Latina elected to San Jose City Council. During Blanca's time in office, she fought for better representation of the Chicano community in San Jose, helped foster the arts, and often advocated on behalf of youth and minorities. Blanca played a significant role in lobbying for the Latino community of the city, including improving representation on the city's decision-making bodies and the development of facilities such as a new youth center. Blanca Alvarado is known as La Madrina, the godmother of East San Jose. Thank you, Blanca Alvarado, for being here. Um, our second panelist is Maria Reyes. Uh, Maria Reyes is a longtime San Jose community volunteer and former Santa Clara County Custody Support Officer. For Maria, community and volunteering go hand in hand. In every job Maria has held, she always found a way to get involved to help her community. Maria has volunteered with the Second Harvest Food Bank at the Tro Tropicana Shopping Center for approximately 16 years and has met many interesting people during her service. Currently, Maria is a vice president of the Cassell Neighborhood Association and a friend of the library at Hillview branch. Thank you, Maria, for being here with us today, too. Um, we also have Mayra Pelagio Munoz. She is a community activist and executive director of LUNA, Latinos United for a New America. As an activist, Mayra grasps the power of unity. And after completing a fellowship for immigrant justice with the UCLA Labor Center, she worked as a community organizer where she learned and harnessed the power of organizing. In her leadership role at LUNA, Maida is committed to working with communities, communities in East San Jose to make advancements in important issues that include healthcare, housing, immigrant rights, and environmental justice. And our last panelist for today is Lydia Valencia. Um, she is a community health worker for Santa Clara Family Health Plan at the New Blanca Alvarado Community Resource Center. Um, Lydia was born in Michoacan, Mexico, is a wife, mother of two amazing children, daughter of loving parents, and most importantly, a community leader who embraces collaborating, engaging, building, and empowering communities by bringing resources to fill in the gaps between families and government agencies. Her work started as a promotora door knocking around the community and holding in-person meetings where she learned uh, to assess and collect information about community needs. She also worked with the Mexican consulate as an outreach specialist that engaged with families and encouraged them to make the necessary changes to practice a healthier lifestyle. Thank you all for being here with us today. So we're gonna get started with some questions that we're gonna ask and you guys can jump in and answer any way you want. So our first question right here is how do you define civic engagement? Blanca, if you would like to start um, by providing an answer to that. Um, so how do you define civic engagement? Do you want us to raise our hand or how do you want us to answer? Oh. It's just a natural conversation. So if you guys want to jump in, you guys can jump in. Um, if you want to raise your hand, that's okay too. Okay, I'll jump in. Okay. I would define community engagement or civic engagement. I, to me, it's part of my community. It's knowing what is happening in my community, what the needs of my community are, how we can better serve the community one person at a time. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maria. Yeah. Um, I, okay, my turn. So I started volunteering since 20 years ago, and I didn't know that that was a civic engagement. Mm -hmm. So for a long time, uh, I've been practicing that. So I define um, the civic engagement when an individual 
works for his uh, community and encourage others to do the same. When you are looking to improve, to help the communities and their needs. So everybody can, uh, or everybody are doing a civic en engagement when they are passing that information to others. Thank you, Lydia. Yeah, I, um, yeah, I wanna elevate what folks have been saying, and this is Mara speaking. Um, any step that you take to collaborate with your community, to improve your quality of life, um, that, that would be civic engagement. I think we can talk about it more in the sense of getting involved with politics, getting involved um, with voting, making sure that you're voting, make, making sure that you are providing uh, comments when important policies come to the city council or to the county board of supervisors, the state, that is another form of civic engagement. But the first step is going to those uh, volunteering Hi, opportunities, talking. going to those meetings, um, even being part of something like this, just by you taking the time to listen to others and to hear what's happening in your community, you're already taking that action um, and you're getting civically involved. You might have. I'm Blanca Alvarado. If you would like to um, add what you think civic engagement is, how would you define civic engagement? I'm Blanca. I think uh, you're on mute right now. Good afternoon, Freya, and good afternoon to all of the wonderful, wonderful panelists and people that are participating with this group. As a political activist for my entire life, it is a very easy question to answer. It really, really refers to people who join other movements to share the values that unite, that address the inequities in society, and that represent fully who we are in identity, in purpose, and in recognition that we are entitled to all of the equality and all of the rights of everybody else. And to affirm that strongly is to be community connected and to be an example of, of civic engagement. I have had the great honor in recent times to meet Mayra Bellagio and Maricela Lechugra uh, and Lydia. And of course, I've known Maria Reyes for ages because we've been on the same track for such a long time to close the airport. But these are wonderful examples of community engagement at its very best because they have put aside their own comforts and their own needs and at some times even neglected their families and their loved ones because the purpose of defending the community when right is being committed is the most valuable example of community engagement. Thank you, Blanca. Okay, so we're gonna move on to our next question and maybe we can go in the order that you guys are answering. Um, so for Lydia, um, can each of you please tell us how you began to get involved in the community? How did it start for you, Lydia? How did you start to become civically engaged? Um, I have a, a story behind that. So when I was 15 years old on my town in Mexico, uh, suddenly I found a big lump in my breast. Mm -hmm. So we went to the doctor, we didn't have money. And the doctor said, it could be a cancer tumor. So at that moment, without any information, without, without any help, uh, any options because we lack of information at that time, I thought that it was the end for me. So I lay down on my bed and waiting for the worst thing, thinking that there were no solutions because my, my parents didn't have money to bring me more uh, to, uh, to the city to find help. So thanks God that my sister who was living here at the United States, she told me, Lydia, come with me. Here you're gonna find the help. So without thinking on my 16 years old, after three months with a deep depression, I decided to come. 
So I was very yeah. young, but um, I decided to find help for me. So when I came here in Mariatri, I have the privilege to find help and uh, community um, clinics. So I was incredible. That feeling, it was amazing because I was thinking that I will pass away. But after they told me, yeah, everything gonna be free for you. You're gonna get a surgery and you're gonna be okay. So incredible, they helped me. In a few days, they, uh, I got the surgery. The tumor was benign. But for me, it was a com commitment myself to all the situations that we pass by ourselves is because we are lack of information. Mm -hmm. And then that is my um, purpose. I, I, I found it as a purpose of life that every time that I have opportunity, every time that I go to the store, every time that I go everywhere, and I know I find a person who needs help in different areas, I share with them that there are options, that there we can find it together and they can feel better and they can feel hope in their lives. So that is how I start to practicing to the civic engagement, to let the communities, let my people know that we still can find that needs. Sometimes ba basic needs for some people is like the end of the world. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is how I start as um, being a volunteer and sharing, about passing the voice about everything. We are privileged here at this country because in our towns in, in Mexico, um, it was a horrible experience, but at the same time, I give thanks to God that I uh, receive all this commitment, this uh, vocation. It's like a vocation for me. So thank you for asking. Thank you, Lydia. Thank you for your answer too. And we're gonna go now with Maria. So Maria Reyes, um, can you please tell us how you began to get involved with the community as well? Well, my commitment began like when I was a little kid. I remember my dad taking us to church and every day after the service, he would, you know, kind of chit chat with people that he knew. So we were of course bored and jumping all over the place. So he tells us, go pick up the books, go pick up the papers. So we would literally go back into the church, pick up all the books people had left, the gum, the papers. And I remember it's like, well, this is not my job, but my dad said to do it. So we were good kids. And I guess from that early age, it was like you were there and you were there to serve some purpose. You just cannot stand there and kind of watch the world go around. You got to get involved. And, and that's how I remember that I got started. And throughout my life, what I've noticed is no matter what job I have, every job that I have always seems to have that part of me where it says you need to work at something within that job or that purpose or whatever to help bring our communities together. So that's how I got started. Thank you, Maria. That's a wonderful answer too. Um, and now we're going to Mayra Pelagio. So Mayra, can you tell us how you began to get involved with the community? Yeah, of course. Um, I think I really started to be fully involved um, during the Trump administration era. Of course, my, my background highly influenced it. My, my great grandma, was a promotora herself back in Mexico where she talked to everybody in the community. She saw she sold something like Herbalife, but it's Omni Life. So having those connections with community was really important. And um, I really owe to her being able to create connections with community and understanding the importance of that connectivity. Um, and I think for me, when Trump came into office, it was a big wake up call for all of the injustices that the community was feeling. Um, and um, I had the fellowship with Sacred Heart and with the Rapid Response Network. 
which is a phone number that people can call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, in case that they see ICE activity or immigration enforcement activity. And what we do, we would um, dispatch volunteers that would go to the scene and prevent or try to prevent arrests. And um, it was a really difficult job because there were people's lives in the line and I got to hear and, and experience people being at risk of deportation. And um, in one of the cases, uh, somebody was arrested at around 4 a.m. and we got the call in. We're able to dispatch not only um, volunteers, but also attorneys. And um, if they were arrested probably like at 4 a.m., by 10 a.m. they were already out. And that just told me the power that community would have, not only in providing that support, but also making sure that we keep our communities protected. And um, every time that we would dispatch, there would be six to 10 volunteers going to the scene and there were many arrests that were prevented. And that was really beautiful to me. Um, so I started thinking through, if we can do this, how much more we can do? Um, and working with Luna, I started going door knocking and um, having, the house meetings and I love the sense of a house meeting where somebody opens their door and we have some watermelon, some panecito, um, and we can start having conversations about the issues and also thinking through like, what are we gonna do together to solve these issues? So um, it was really, uh, the, the part when I started was when the Trump administration was attacking our community and I just saw how powerful it was that we were all united and that we could work together to protect our communities. Thank you so much, Mayra. I'm Blanca. How did you get involved with the community? I think my engagement in the community began specifically when I was a student at San Jose High. You know, we were just a handful of Chicano students. There couldn't have been more than 30 of us in the um, student body at that time. And we formed what we called El Club Tapatio. And I, to this day, don't know why we named it such. But it was a means of organizing ourselves for the purpose of identifying as Chicanos. It was also an opportunity to learn about being um, generous to others. And we literally had food drives and clothing drives to be able to take care of the marginalized and the poor and the needy. Uh, but my entire life has been connected to a movement. I think movements are so important because they connect you with people of like mind who want to make the world a better place for, for everybody. And so from my involvement at San Jose High, I think I just gradually evolved into a participant with, at Guadalupe Church, with the farm worker movement, at Most Holy Trinity Church. And in each one of those instances, in particular at the beginning, it was a grounding with community that lasted a lifetime. No matter what I happens in life, for me, the fact that I worked with the Guadalupe Church and with Cesar Chavez and Most Holy Trinity to demand equality at the Catholic level was something that's remained with me forever. And as a result, every organization that I belong to as a volunteer, whether it was walking precincts for a favored candidate, or whether it was the Chicano Employment Committee seeking employment opportunities for all, or whether it was the Mexican American Political Association. In all instances, my involvement with community-based organizations was the springboard for something better and better, where I was able to finally play, be at a place where I could use my influence as a city council member or as a supervisor to really speak out in favor of equality and equal access to resources. Um, I think that my life has been an adventure and it's been an adventure because it has been coupled with so many wonderful, wonderful people. And because this is Women's, Mar uh, Women's History Month, I will take the liberty of calling out four of my contemporaries that we just really did outstanding warrior work during our highest uh, uh, times of, of the highest effort. Esther Medina, she was the one that formed the Mexican American Community Services and as a result, established the daycare center for the elderly and for the infirm and also housing, house, affordable housing in East San Jose. 
um, there was uh, Esther, that, that was Esther Medina. Sofia Mendoza was a true advocate for displaced, potentially displaced residents in the Guadalupe Azurez area because the city had decided to take that property away, eminent domain, in order to, buy, to build the convention center. And the person that I admire to this day so much is um, B. Robinson. She was the first woman to establish a, a center, a refuge for battered women. And um, Ernestina, Garcia, Ernestina Garcia was the leader against police brutality. So in all of those instances, we were activists who were accomplishing a purpose which was directing uh, our energies against the inequities of the times. And so being a part of something, being a part of a movement, for example, being a part of the farm worker movement, not only allowed us to be givers and not only allowed us to be advocates on behalf of farm worker families, but it was an experience that lasted a lifetime. And even to this day, when we think about our days as farm worker advocates and joining forces with Cesar Chavez, it is probably one of the highlights of my life and the lives of many. Thank you so much, Blanca. We're going to be moving on to our next question. And this is going to go is back. Is Maricela here? Oh, Maricela I was not able to make it today. Oh, OK. Yeah, we did invite her. <laughs> OK, we're going to go back to Lydia. Um, so Lydia, what have been some of the most rewarding experiences working with community members on the east side of San Jose and beyond? Rewarding experiences, definitely when they came back and say thank you, because they found uh, the resources or what they were looking for. So when they come back and share with me that they now are changing their lives, that made me feel so great and thankful that I can um, share with them. Thank you, Lydia. And Maria Reyes, um, what have been some of the most rewarding experiences working with community members on the east side, uh, east side of San Jose and beyond? <laughs> I have to say for me, it's been so rewarding that we started planting trees a couple of years ago. And it's so nice to see the kids come back and tell another kid, hey, don't kick my tree because I planted that. So it's just been, I mean, you, you see these little minds that are barely beginning to develop and you go, you know what? Our community is getting better and our community is healing in a different direction because when you have children that can visualize these little tiny trees growing up into these big old nice trees, then something has happened in the community. And aside from having people thank you, because it does come when people are grateful, but you see your community change. You see the trees that are growing up. You see people coming. And to me, that's the biggest reward that we can get many more people involved in communities. Thank you, Maria. That's very powerful. Okay, so Maida, if you would like to answer that question, what have been some of the most rewarding experiences working with the community members of the East Side of San Jose and beyond? Yeah, I there's so many, there's so many rewarding experiences. Like uh, Lydia was saying, every time people come and say thank you, that's really rewarding. But the most exciting part for me is when I see the mujeres developing, the the women of the community, the caregivers. Um, evolving in such a way that they're more more passionate they're more vocal they're more willing to take a stand to protect themselves and the community that is the most rewarding thing to watch um, I've seen community members community leaders go from being really shy and being um, really afraid to speak up to being able to speak to masses being able to speak at city hall um, and that has been of the, one of the most rewarding things to watch um, seeing people take that step and bringing that change that they want to see in the community. It's really powerful. Thank you, Maida. And Blanca, um, what are some of the, um, I'm sorry, what have been some of the most rewarding experiences working with community members on the east side of San Jose and beyond? Ophelia, is that for me? Yes. <laughs> oh, you know, um, 
I have to take a moment to do a shout out for Maria Reyes sample of community engagement, uh, who is persistent, who loves her community, and is such a giver of herself and her talents. And she's just been a hero in my estimation. But I think after many, many years of, wait, of waiting for change to take place surrounding the Re Hillview Airport, the most rewarding moment occurred very recently, last August, when we had at the Hillview Library on the park, the most amazing outpouring of support in favor of closure. You know, we had worked for many, many years in that direction, always hoping that those in power would recognize the dangers that this airport posed on families that live on the east side and never to any avail because as much as we struggled, as much as we protested, as what, much as we advocated for closure, everything was closed doors on us. But when we really began to experience in December of 2019, an opening as we had never had before, when the Board of Supervisors on a three vote, three votes to uh, three to two vote, decided that the closure of Reed Hillview was in the interest of the community. We were elated. But then to see the coming together of the community in large numbers at that rally with participants from all over the county, not just from the east side, but partners from all over the county, standing side by side with us to advocate for the closure. It was a moment of exhilaration because it proved, again, how important it is for the community to stand with each other. Because after all is said and done, no one can do anything by himself or herself. It is only done to such a great and successful extent as long we, we as long as we do it together. Thank you, Blanca. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to our next question. And I'm gonna kind of clump that one with the next one we have as well. Um so Lydia. Uh -huh. um, what are some of the challenges you have faced when engaging with community and how have you managed to overcome some of those challenges and when life is busy how can we still make time to give back to our communities um the challenges that we have and on, i think all of you are going to be agree with me is gain that trust of the community because they already had a lot of uh, bad experiences that is not easy to trust again. So every time that we, uh, we have to be intentional and give them the best in that way they can come back. So that is one of the challenges, but when you do your best and you are knowledge of the services, then they can uh, feel more uh, trust and they can trust more in us. So, at this time, everybody are very busy. We are very busy, but still we can um, share our information. As I mentioned it before, every time that we go to the store, that we go to the supermarket, everywhere, we can be uh, aware and see if there is something that we can help somebody. And then is the opportunity to share the information we have. Because people, uh, when we offer the services, they uh, have fear to get those because they they think that after that we're gonna look for the re reimbursement from them, and it's not like that. But it's because they already uh, passed that experience. So we can uh, everywhere where we, where we go, we can share the information and practice in that civic engagement with them. So there is not a specific time. <laughs> Very true. Thank you, Lydia. And Maria, if you would like to answer that question, too. So what are some of the challenges you have faced when engaging with community? And how have you managed to overcome some of those challenges? And when life is busy, how can we still make time to give back? I think for me, one of the challenges that we face is we live in a Latino community. 
And it is so hard to engage the Latinos and say, look, we can change. There is hope out there. And I think for me, that's one of the hardest challenges because like Lydia said, we are so used to being beat down and beat down and beat down. And pretty soon all those dreams that you had, all the hopes that you had, they kind of just go away. But for me, I think the challenge is we've got to start getting people to dream again. We've got to be the dreamers. We've got to be the movers. You know, we have so much talent with women, so much talent with the youth, so much talent with our men that are go to work every day. We just need to start building dreamers. So for me, that's kind of what, I mean, I want to build dreamers and that's my dream. And uh, what was the other part of the question? Oh, when life is busy, how can we still make time to give back to our communities? You know, when life is busy, because we're all busy, but it only takes one minute for you to make a phone call or one minute for you, you know, if you go someplace just to smile at somebody, just to give somebody a positive. And I think that is really one of the biggest challenges that we have because people are afraid to talk to other people. People are afraid to socialize and we like to isolate ourselves, but we need to begin to open up to other people. And yeah, sometimes, you know, people are going to think, hey, look at that weirdo. But you know what? We, we can just start every day and say, you know what? What can I do to make it better today? Thank you. Mike. That's it. Thank you. And Maida, um, I'll, I'll ask the question again. Um, what are some challenges you have faced when engaging with community and how are you, how have you managed to overcome some of those challenges? And when life is busy, how can we still make time to give back? Thank you. And I just want to elevate Maria's message because she's always reminding me to keep on dreaming. <laughs> I love that. Um, there have been, there is a lot of challenges. I feel the, La the Latina community, um, has many disadvantages in many different ways. And similar to what Lydia is mentioning, gaining that trust after they have been down this path many times in um, many other instances is really tough um, with different neighborhoods. And also one of the biggest challenges that we see now, especially around housing is that rent is very expensive. Uh, most of our community members have to have two jobs to be able to afford living in San Jose. Um, and if they don't have two jobs, they have one that is super tiring. And when they get home, they don't have time or um, mental cap capability for like anything else. They just want to rest. And that's, uh, that's justifiable. So um, I think the most important part on getting that involvement and making sure that people stay involved is that um, we need to have that reflection as to why is it that you have to have two jobs to be able to afford a place in San Jose? Why is it that your children are not getting the education that they need or the quality of education that they need? Um, and having those conversations and having that space for reflectivity to be able to think that if we are not um, able to take a step and demand policy change or demand that uh, we have all of the resources that we need, then it's not going to happen. It takes that first step to identify why are things happening the way that they're happening, and then being able to say, what can I do to bring that change? And I know that people are busy, and I know that there is other things that, um, that could be prioritized, but taking those first steps is really important, whether that be in your neighborhood. I know for some of our neighborhoods, one of the biggest problems is trash. And they're always saying that, well, our neighborhood looks really ugly. We are trashy and things of that sort. So if it takes just five minutes to go outside and pick up trash, that's one thing that you can do to improve the way that you see your neighborhood and the way that you see your, your livelihood as well. Um, coming to meetings and learning about the different things that are happening. I know that um, policies are really complicated and unfortunately policies are things that influence our quality of life. But if we have an hour to dedicate to learning about some of the policies that are being uh, talked about at the city or the county, um, it's really important that we spend that time learning and thinking through how to engage around those issues that ultimately will have a big impact as to how our quality of life um, is in, in San Jose specifically. Thank you so much, Faira. Mm -hmm. 
And Blanca, um, so now it's your turn. <laughs> so what are some challenges you have faced when engaging with community? And how, how have you managed to overcome some of these challenges? And when life is busy, how can you still make time to give back? Well, one in my experience, one of the most frustrating parts of being in, in politics is to encourage and to allow people to understand how absolutely essential it is to vote. You know, we know that we have the numbers to be very successful in supporting candidates of our choice, but it is so hard sometimes to get people to understand that although not only is it an obligation and a responsibility to vote, but the outcomes can signify great success and well-being for a community, or they can be the reverse. And so teaching people about the importance of civic en engagement through voter education is one of the challenges that we face all the time. You know, in the last two years, it has been particularly difficult because with COVID, Families who struggle economically to survive in this Eastside community are having to do jobs that require full time, day and night, weekends included. And so when they are essential workers and are forced to be out there in the streets to support their families, they are exposing themselves, they expose themselves to the dangers of COVID. And so we know that the number of fatalities in the Latino community have been extremely high in the last two years. And so we have to persist and persist and persist that not only do they have to appeal and join our forces in getting more political power so that we can advocate on their behalf and so that we can make the society more equitable. But it is a challenge and it is not without heartache. Uh, many, many times we have sought diligently to get people to exercise their right to vote with sometimes little success. But I think that the younger generation offers much more hope that the value of voting is being more recognized and that we will be seeing higher and higher numbers of participation. And it is essential, absolutely essential because without political power to advocate for the necessities in our communities, we have to rely on others who may not have the sensitivity or the interest to advocate strongly on behalf of our communities. So let's vote, let's educate ourselves. And even when we can't um, participate fully to learn about all of the issues, let's try to figure out who are the leaders that we can trust that can guide us in our decision-making. Because there again, leadership is important. And when I see Maida and the work that she's doing now with, with Luna, that is an indication of a community engagement that's going to pay off big time in time in, in days and weeks to come. This is an election year. Mm -hmm. And who we elect locally will determine the direction that this county and this city go through in the next several, several years. So how we get our young people, our 18-year-olds, to take advantage of the opportunity to vote and to be educated on the issues is, I think, the major challenge that is facing us today. Thank you so much, Blanca. Okay, so now we're going to go back to Lydia. Um, Lydia, can you please tell us about the new uh, Santa Clara Family Health Plan Blanca Alvarado Community Resource Center? And how can community members join programs and services offered there? Yes, this community research center just opened last July. So we have a great team here that we are looking forward not only to give the flyers and set goodbye to the families, but we are looking to engage with them. And at this moment, we have a um, resident advisory group. Those are uh, 18 residents from East San Jose who we meet them every, every month. And we talk about the community's needs. We give them tools to go back and to their neighborhoods and share the information. So we are commitment to bring the community all together as most as we can. So this center is a place where they can feel 
protected, they can feel respected, they can feel um, safe every time that, it, that they come. So we have a lot of services. We are still uh, working on the um, agenda, on the framework of the center, but we already have a lot of good experiences with the community because we already have a few uh, community events and we have a good answer from, from them. So here we have the application assistance program where we can assist them with the medical, any issue with medical, they can apply, they can renewal. If they have any uh, trade with a medical, we call medical, we fix all uh, situations that they have because it's part of the civic engagement. They can have health insurance, no matter if it's uh, emergency medical, but they have something. At the moment that they get sick, they are not feeling lost because we not only apply for them, but we educate them. It's not like, okay, I fill it up the application for you and go ahead, bye-bye. We educate them, okay, this is like this, you're gonna use your card. We have orientations, member orientations for uh, every medical member. Um, we teach them how to use the program, the benefits and a lot of things like that. So besides the application assistance center, we have a healthy eating workshops. We have free Zumba um, during the week. We have, um, what else? We have other, other um, activities during the month as the vaccination clinics where people can get the vaccine and get uh, like a reward, $50 reward. So we're having a successful answer from them. So we are so happy to um, feel so privileged and to work here as a community health worker. And please, as I mentioned it before, uh, anytime uh, that you wanna come here and uh, you can get a tour around, you can learn more about what are our plans for the future. But we are not just uh, giving information everywhere. We are trying to listen in the community through the resident advisory group. Who can be uh, aware as them to let us know what does the community needs? And in the, the last August, we start completing a surveys where we can see the needs and we can ask them what does the community wish to have mm -hmm. and what they need to have. Mm -hmm. And we found that the three top needs is um, housing, mm -hmm. food, and health insurance. Mm -hmm. So now we are getting focused on that. We are put, putting all on that basket to make sure that we can make changes in East San Jose. Thank you, Lydia, and thank you for the important work you're doing in the community. Um, so we will all have to pay a visit to the new uh, Community Resource Center. Thank you. Um, and Maria, I have a question for you too. So can you please tell us about the Cassell Neighborhood Association, Friends of the Library, and current projects you're working on, and how can community members get involved in this work? Currently, what Cassell Neighborhood Association is working on, and I'm part of that one too, is we are working for early closure of the airport. And like Blanca said, we have been so fortunate that we had other agencies come and walk the street with us. Never in the history of Hillview Airport have we ever gotten to the point where we're at now. So yes, we're really happy that we got this far, but I'm the dreamer and I keep on saying, I have still have a lot more dreams. And we are beginning to do the visioning process for what we want when the airport is gone. And our vision, my vision is I wanna have a big like uh, swimming pool for our kids, basketball courts. We want our youth to begin to dream. We want our youth to have programs where they can build and have careers when they leave high school. I mean, I want our kids, we are a community that has worked really hard 
You know, we're the ones that are the custodians, we're the childcare, you know, all the dead end jobs the Latino community has. My vision is that we are going to have those dreamers that are going to be the presidents of their own companies because we're gonna give them the tools. So that's my dream for what we're working on at the airport. And how people can get involved, might have touched on this, that we are beginning to have house meetings. We want our community, we want everybody that lives in the 95122 area code, join us, come see the vision, come get involved. Because like Blanca said, yes, this is an election year. And we want those people that are going to be elected to represent the Eastside community. Aside from all the other issues that we're looking at, I really feel that our community should have reparation for the 40 years that our community has had the lead issue in our community. The other issue that we're working on is we are going to be going again this year and doing tree planting in the communities. Mm -hmm. So eventually Cassell will probably be known as the tree planting community, but we see that as a future for our families. Right. We see that as a future for our community and anybody that would love to come, would love to have you share. We are having a meeting this coming Sunday, April the 3rd at 10 o'clock in the morning over at Hillview Park, Hank Lopez Center. So if you're free at 10 o'clock, come join us. <laughs> In addition to that, we were we will be planting uh, trees also at the Hillview Library, right, Maria? Yes, we are. We're going to plant trees and and flowers. Mm -hmm. So, if you guys would like to join us, that will take place on May twenty first. Okay. So now um, we're moving on to the next question, and thank you, Maria, for sharing. Um, Maida, uh, can you tell us about Luna and how can community members get involved with Luna? Yeah, definitely. Um, LUNA stands for Latinos United for Any America, and we work with the Latina community um, in different neighborhoods and around different area uh, issue areas um, that are important to community members. So right now, um, as Maria mentioned, one of our priorities is this environmental justice issue or environmental injustice um, around the Reed Hillview Airport that as some of you all may know, last August, the county released a study that demonstrated that children living closer to the Reed Hillview Airport have higher levels of lead in the system. And it was directly linked to the uh, fumes coming out of the aircrafts in Reed Hillview Airport. And lead exposure leads to several things and um, health damages, including um, some sort of damage for uh, learning abilities for in children, and children who are exposed are more likely to um, have that learning disabilities. And we wanna make sure that folks who live in the area know about what happened. At the moment, we know that in August there was a meeting and there were two different um, presentations about the study, but the presentations were two hours long and they were very complicated. They had a lot of medical jargon. And given that it was only two of them, they were very limited to who could attend. So we're making sure that we're going door to door and we're talking to community members and hosting these house meetings to spread that information and think with community about what they wanna see and how they wanna move forward knowing this information that for over 40 years, like Maria's mentioning, they have been exposed to these pollutants. And um, Blanca did an, an amazing job and I'm so honored that we're continuing the work that she has been doing for, for the community in the airport. She, she was the first one who told the representatives that this was an environmental uh, issue long time ago, a really long time ago. So the representatives already knew and we're continuing that work and hopefully we will be able to achieve early closure. It's a really complicated process because there is the FAA, a federal agency involved, um, but we're sure we're continuing to dream like Maria is saying and working with community um, to develop that campaign. And this is one of the areas that we have been working on, but other areas that the Latino community um, is interested or have been issues that we have been facing is housing like, like Lydia was mentioning. And we work closely with tenants to ensure that we're bringing empowerment and we're bringing um, information about know your rights for tenants 
Um, right now, today we have the COPA March. I don't know if you all are familiar with, with COPA Community Opportunity to Purchase Act. We're ensuring that there is a pathway to home ownership for tenants and preventing displacement as well. So we're working with 10 promotoras that are going door to door, talking about the protections that are in place now. Unfortunately, the state will no longer be able to provide financial assistance for the month of April. Um, but we're talking about other ways that people can get involved, including um, calling the representatives to extend the moratorium and ensuring that we're getting active politically and thinking through what other policies can we implement that will ensure that tenants stay in their homes and stay housed and preventing homelessness and preventing displacement of the Latino community in San Jose. Uh, we have two other big campaigns. One is a transportation campaign uh, because as you may or may not know, we are affected by heavy traffic. There is really high cost of transit. It's not secure. Tra public transit is not secure. It's expensive. It's, it's a really long time. And so there's a couple of um, policies that are going to be coming up to city council to determine how transportation will look like in San Jose and what will be prioritized in the next few years. So we have a workshop uh, on April 5th to talk about transit first, a policy that is being proposed. All of our workshops and meetings are in Spanish. And so if you're interested in joining, um, we would be sure to provide English interpretation if that's needed, but all of our meetings are uh, presented in Spanish. And the last campaign that we have is Papeles para Todos, Citizenship for All. We work with community members who have uh, worked with the Rapper Response Network that I mentioned before, and uh, who are continuing to advocate for a pathway to citizenship. Um, making sure that we're developing this campaign and push for that. The goal is to have a general strike, um, similar to what happened in 2016, and we're gathering people and getting people together. And um, we actually were the group that shut down the Golden Gate back in October, demanding the Congress to uh, not listen to the parliamentarian and include citizenship role in the budget reconciliation. Unfortunately, that didn't happen, but that doesn't mean that we don't need to organize. We're still organizing and we meet every other Wednesday uh, to continue to build that power. The community will need to push for citizenship for all. Thank you so much, Maida. Amazing work, um, an amazing can I, answer. <laughs> can I add one thing, Ophelia, to what oh, Myra has said? Yes. You know, the issue of public transportation is again, one of those issues that we have sought for decades to get improvement in the east side. Because we are so public transport, transit, public transit dependent, we have fought with the VTA and with all of the cities in the county for our fair share of dollars to improve transportation. And I'm glad to know that Luna and Myra are, <laughs> are continuing the battle to get some adequate improvements or some important improvements out to the east side. But if I may interrupt one final time, I wanted to say to Lydia that the resource services uh, and the opportunities that are going to, that exist at that center are invaluable. But one of the things that we have to remember in this terrible, terrible past two and a half years with the, with the pandemic, is that it also, in addition to decimating families and hurt and killing people. Um, it also engendered some real controversies around vaccines and around masks. So how we use the center as a bridge for enlighten, enlightenment for, um, I mean, there are so many divisions in society and how we use the center also as a place to reconcile, to get to know each other better to improve community relations is going to be really, really important. So I applaud Lydia and the work that the management is doing at the Research Center, but let's make it also a gathering uh, place for healing the wounds that the pandemic has uh, surfaced in many of us. Thank you so much, Blanca. Um, so our last question is actually for you. We are at time, so we might go a few minutes over. I hope that will be okay with everyone, but I really want to hear her answer to these questions. <laughs> um, so this week we celebrate Cesar Chavez Day on Thursday, March 31st, to honor the enduring legacy of the American labor rights hero. Blanca, can you please share reflections and thoughts regarding your experience working with Cesar Chavez? Is there something you learned from him? And what do you think he learned from you? 
Well, the first thing that I have to say about Cesar is that he was a man of the, of the people. Uh, he was meek, he was humble, he was honest, he was down to earth. And he cared really deeply about people and never, never forgot that he started off with his family as a farm worker and his advocacy on behalf of farm worker families is legendary. Nobody can dispute that he started a movement of such far reaching consequences. And today, as I said earlier in my comments, my appreciation for my work with Caesar and the farm worker movement is something that I, that I hold very deeply in my heart as one of the best things that I could have done in my life. You know, it is um, remarkable that his birthday celebration is coming up uh, in a day or two. And when I was on the city council, I am so proud to be able to say that I was the one that initiated the effort to, make, to name the Plaza Park downtown to Plaza de Cesar Chavez. I'm really proud about that. And believe it or not, when I was on the Board of Supervisors, the struggle to declare a holiday in memory of Cesar Chavez's birthday was a task of such heroic proportions because it was not easily accomplished. It took six months for the Board of Supervisors to come to the realization that that was a necessary thing to do. And finally, two things remain that aggravate me to no end and that I hope the dreamers of East San Jose, Mayra, Maria, and all of the rest of you will pursue until it is accomplished. I had tried on the Board of Supervisors to name Capital Expressway as the Cesar Chavez Boulevard. Well, I don't, do not want to go into the sad story why it didn't happen. <laughs> but I will say that that memorial that is designated on Sharp Avenue as a place where Caesar lived is totally inadequate. It is an embarrassment. It should have a bigger tribute and a bigger memorial at that site because it is a historical site. And so to the extent that all of you activists can do something about it, lobby the city council, the board of supervisors to do a better memorial for Cesar Chavez. Thank you, Blanca. And what do you think Cesar Chavez might have learned from you? I think sisterhood, brotherhood, <laughs> and also just connection. Connection because we were all on the same plateau of doing better in a society that had marginalized farm workers and that has never truly appreciated the work that they do to feed our families, to feed us and our families. To this day, the fact that he was a nonviolent agitator for social justice is something that is not fully recognized and should be recognized. His nonviolent movement is something that we should be practicing today. We should be practicing nonviolence for all of the injustices that still plague our society. And for East San Joseans, for uh, all of us who live here and who have lived here all of our lives, we still have work to do. And we don't give up easily because what we do have within us is persistence. We know right from wrong. And the wrongs that have been committed against Eastsiders, decent, hardworking people will not be corrected, will not be relieved until we get the political power and the people in authority to understand that we deserve respect, we deserve to be honored, and we deserve justice and equality. Thank you so much, Blanca. We appreciate all of you for being here today. Thank you so much for making time in your busy schedules, Blanca Alvarado, Mayra Pelagio, Mayra, uh, Maria Reyes, and also Lydia Valencia. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you for sharing all these answers to these wonderful questions and inspiring all of us to become more engaged and active in our communities. Working together, we can accomplish a lot more. Um, so I hope everybody's gonna leave inspired today um, and take some steps towards becoming more involved in your communities. Thank you. Thank you, Ophelia. Thank you. So Thank you, much. Ophelia. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Ophelia. Thank Beautiful. you, Ophelia. Thank you all. <laughs> Have a Thank you guys. Evening. Thank you.